Ladies and gentlemen, can good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, it is. Uh, it's my undivided pleasure to be able to welcome you uh, to this conference today, the future of the UN in international peace and security. Um, and on behalf of the, the organizers, which are the Danish UN Association, the Academic Council on the UN System, and the Center for Military Studies, I would like to take a few minutes to go through the, the program and, and to give you some, some practical messages. Uh, but I'll just like to briefly introduce myself first. I'm Troel Daniel, and uh, I have been the main organizer of today's event, and you will all have received at least one email from me, so, um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to finally be here and to meet you in, in person. Uh, thank you uh, for coming. It's, it's wonderful to see uh, such a, a wonderful uh, show. Um, I've just recently defended my PhD on uh, the UN Security Council, and it was during this research that I found it necessary to broaden the debate about the role that the UN can play in peace and security, especially here in Denmark. And so that's actually part of, of, of the motivation for, for, for the conference today. Um, I wrote my dissertation while based at the Center for Military Studies, uh, and I've also organized the conference from there. And, um, and it is part of the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. Today is going to be a an exciting day, I think. Uh, we're going to hear from a range of the most insightful uh, people about the UN and international peace and security. We have uh, both some former and active duty practitioners who can teach us about how it is uh, to be in the UN, how the UN functions in practice uh, in different parts. And we also have some uh, inspiring scholars uh, who have studied the UN and international rel relations in depth and who have condensed years of analysis so that we can learn from them today and together. That will give us the different pieces that we hopefully need uh, to the puzzle of where is the global order headed these days and what is it the, the role, uh, what is it that the UN can do and what should it do? So the UN was established in, in 1945, of course, as a central element of a new multilateral order, and the main purpose was to prevent war. The founders were inspired by interstate wars mostly um, because of the two world wars. Now, however, the old and new conflicts have flared up in which civilians fight civilians, in which non-state armed actors fight each other. And these conflicts are difficult to handle in the UN's very state-centric negotiations and peace operations. At the same time, 
uh, debates about non-traditional security threats have entered the UN. So now it's, there's talk about how um, climate change, epidemics, hunger, water scarcity, marginalization, how they can be drivers of conflicts, which is also a new development. And it is in this present situation that the UN has uh, reformulated uh, its main goal to be about conflict prevention. For example, has the Secretary General has established a high-level advisory board on mediation. And the idea is to be able to make more early and political interventions in potential conflicts. So something is clearly happening. Roles are being reversed. Traditional ways of doing global governance are being challenged. Conflicts change character. And um, new types of solutions are being proposed. So I look very much forward to today because we will be able to hear a lot of analysis and debate about these kinds of questions and answers. And you, as uh, the participants, will be able to add your questions on the way at several points. Um, and, and these questions and answers will be, uh, will be guided by our four excellent moderators for the panels today. And I would like to briefly uh, introduce the moderators and then they in turn can, can introduce the speakers uh, at the individual panels. You all have a, a program on, the, on the, the little folder on your seat. On the back there's a, there's a program you can, you can follow if, if you'd like. Um, the first panel is about the UN's position in the new global order. And this way we sort of begin with the broad questions. Um, what are the developments in the liberal world order? And we're trying to take a helicopter view of what that means for multilateralism, international cooperation, conflict patterns. This panel will be moderated by Louise Ries Andersen. Louise is a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies. Um, and she is probably Denmark's leading scholar on multilateralism and global governance. So I, I would like to thank Louise for, for moderating. It's true, Louise. Um, the second panel moves from, from this very macro uh, perspective to be more concrete about dynamics around the UN's peace operations. Um, since 2015, the concept of sustaining peace has become uh, central in, in the UN. Um, and this is a new understanding in, uh, which means that peace building has, is relevant uh, throughout the conflict cycle, meaning pre-conflict, during armed conflict, and post-conflict. Um, and this has led to an ambition of trying to break down the silos between uh, on the one side, the large peacekeeping operations with their military components, and on the other side, the smaller, more civilian political missions. And this is going to be re reflected in our panel, uh, which will be uh, chaired by Ingle Bode. Ingle is uh, a senior lecturer at the University of Kent, and also a board member of uh, the Academic Council on the UN System. And she's representing Aikens today. Um, Ingle has published groundbreaking research on the role of the UN in armed conflicts, and that's why I think she's uh, perfect for moderating this panel. And then the third panel is, is slightly different. Um, this will be a, a political discussion among the foreign policy spokespersons of the Danish political parties. Um, this is a slight change from the original schedule, but it's reflected in the one you have uh, now. Um, we are very happy to be able to welcome a majority of all the, the foreign policy spokespersons. Um, but the change is because we, we had to swap the timing of this panel and the last, last week because suddenly there was a, a change and a new I, uh, item was added to the legislative timetable in parliament. So the, the politicians will have to debate a new proposed law at the exact time as they were supposed to have our uh, panel here. So we, we changed the time and they proved very flexible. And so we can have it at uh, two o'clock. And this panel will be moderated by uh, my director at the Center for Military Studies, Henrik Beidenbauer. Henrik has uh, years of experience turning uh, research into policy advice. Um, and he's going to help us transition from um, from the more analytical uh, lens in the first panels to, to this more political lens. And then the last panel tackles the issue of UN reform. The UN has basically been trying to reform itself uh, since before it was even established. Um, now, however, just two weeks ago, uh, our reform was actually started of the UN bureaucracy on peace and security. Um, and we are gonna hear something about this. 
there's also growing pressure for reform of the Security Council, but where are we actually with this uh, unicorn of uh, Security Council reform? Um, these are some of the questions that our experts on this panel will, will, will talk about. And the panel will be moderated by Kurt Moskow. Kurt is a retired Major General in the Danish Army. He's also a former force commander of the peacekeeping operation in Western Sahara. And he was uh, commander of Sherbrick, which was the um, international brigade for UN, for rapid UN deployments. Moreover, Kurt is a board member of uh, the Danish UN Association. And the UN Association is also represented today by Jan Estop, the, the chairman, and by Tola Jonasen, the secretary general. Um, but it is Kurt who will take us through the, the panel on, on peace, uh, on reforms, sorry. So please help me give uh, the four moderators uh, a hand. <laughs> but I have not forgotten, of course. We are also going to hear from uh, Jan Eliasen, the former Deputy Secretary General, former President of the UN General Assembly and former Minister of Foreign Affairs is uh, on a plane right now. He's landing very shortly from uh, Stockholm and he's coming to give a keynote speech about the conference theme. So he will tell us about how he sees the future of the UN in international peace and security. At this point, I, the practical message is also, I should, uh, I should probably reassure you that we've also thought of your comfort. Um, First of all, the restrooms, when you're going to need those, you go out here, you turn right into the little niche area there, and you will find signs to the restrooms. Um, throughout the day, we'll have a number of breaks. They are, the timing is indicated in, in, your, in your program. Uh, there will be coffee and some refreshments uh, in the breaks. Right now, there's uh, also water, and there will be more water during the lunch break. The lunch break is at 12.40, and uh, the Snapstingel, the Parliament's uh, restaurant, has promised to serve us their very best sandwiches. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, we're going to have a, a small reception, which simply means that, uh, that we would like to invite you for a glass of wine. Hopefully you would want to, uh, to stay and, and talk to each other and, and, and meet a little bit and continue the discussion over a glass of wine. And all this is made possible by our generous sponsor. Um, the Hamel Lanning Foundation has, um, has uh, sponsored today's conference. They have made it possible to fly in some speakers and to keep us sustained with uh, coffee and food throughout the day. So please also give a hand to, to the Hamel Lanning Foundation. <laughs> and with this, uh, my very last point is that I would like to introduce our host today. We have uh, Mons Lykketsov to thank for being able to be here at Parliament. As our parliamentary host, uh, Mons Lykketsov is going to say a few words about how he sees the UN in peace and security. And Mons Lykketsov is, is in a unique situation to do so. He was, uh, he's now a member of Parliament. He was a Speaker of the Parliament and a Minister of Foreign Affairs. But most importantly for today, he was uh, President of the UN's 70th General Assembly. And this is actually the most prominent role that any Dane has held in the UN. So, uh, so, so that's uh, a, a unique position to be in. And while he was president, he managed to make the UN just a little bit more transparent and a little bit more responsive. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to invite Mons Lugetov to kick off today's meeting officially. Please, Mons, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Parliament of Denmark. Uh, I think it's a very, very important and interesting program. Uh, we have uh, assembled today and a lot of very, very knowledgeable people. So I'll be pretty short in uh, these welcome remarks so that we can go on with the very interesting discussion. I think. Uh, the role of the United Nations in international peace and security uh, is very, very difficult at the moment. Uh, and we have all this basic feeling that, that uh, what, what, what's actually happening here? We have a lot of good people in the United Nations. We have a good Secretary General. 
but we also have a crisis for the whole organization because of the disruption of any kind of multilateral cooperation that's happening because of this president of the United States of America. So it's very, very difficult to give an answer of what will be the future role of the United Nations without making a basic assumption. Is this the beginning of a total disruption or is it a transitional period where we can return to some kind of basic global order? I, I, I tend to think that it is just an interim period. I really hope it will be extremely short. Uh, but I think that what we are facing right now, the reason for this disruption is that we have, not only in the United States, also in Russia, and numerous other places in important countries, away something from other countries and other people. And as it has to be a plus plus game. There is no possibility at all in the real world that one single power can dictate what should happen in the rest of the world. I think the, uh, the past 20 years of, of world history also shows us that even the most mighty, the most military well-equipped power of the world cannot get real control of very far away countries by military power. We have to have regional and international structures in order to have any chance of avoiding conflict, containing conflict, making peace. And it's in, uh, 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 and here we are actually back time, uh, this organization was, uh, was made in order to uh, uh, free the major powers of this world realize that they have more common interests than, than conflicting interests. Constituencies, some with 1,400 million people and some with less people than a provincial city in Denmark and say this is the parliament to decide. You had to give a special role for the major powers, that's what we did in the construction of the UN Security Council. And there is a lot of discussion going on and on and on and on for decades about reform of the UN Security Council. Uh, and the basic observation you have to, to, to make here is that it can only happen with a two-third majority in the General Assembly and the consensus between the five permanent members of the Security Council. That's why it's not happening. And then you can, you can, you can go back and, and, and ask yourself, is this structure so obsolete as we used to say it is? Both yes and no. Of course, we need some new major powers present all the time in the Security Council. But it is still a basic fact of life that there will be no real coordination of efforts to solve economic, climate, environment problems in this world without at least participation of the United States, China, and Europe. And there will be no uh, conflict solutions in those parts of the world where, for instance, Russia don't want to get conflict solved or will only will get them solved, wish to get them solved on their own terms. Because Russia is not a superpower as it was, but it's strong enough to avoid any solutions they disagree with in different areas like Ukraine and Syria. So we are back to the basic understanding that the overall, the big problems can only be solved if and when the major powers in this world uh, uh, realize that they have more common interests than uh, opposing and conflicting interests. But of course, within this framework of, of, of uh, what you could call a cynical uh, conclusion, of course, a lot of things can be done and should be done. UN reform, new concepts of, of, of conflict solution, sustaining peace, and so on, and all the 
have more than 100,000 people uh, in, in blue uniforms and blue, he blue helmets operating in peacekeeping operations and of course that the UN should play a role and contain a conflict. But do we do it in the right way? That will be part of the discussion today. Uh, could we put of the United Nations? And of course, right now it's also a problem. Would we at all be able to mobilize as much resources coming from, from the present president of the United States? There are a lot of very, very basic questions here to discuss, uh, but I think necessary to understand the limitations for the United Nations in this present situation and very important to discuss what will be hopefully the new post-Trump world order where we can take away some of those limitations. I wish you a very, very, very good discussion today uh, given the difficult presence of the world and of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you and congratulations to the organizers um, for setting up the whole conference and also this great panel. Um, and I think we have just heard from uh, from Moons Lukatov a very strong introduction to the themes we're going to discuss here. I think the key, the title of this panel is uh, the position of the UN in the new global order. And, and that title points straight to one of the great questions that I think we're all struggling with these days, you know, what is the new global order? Or, or what, will it, what will it look like? It's who will be, or who will be the key actors, the, the main institutions, the basic norms, the rules, all these things that we've taken granted for so long are somehow in flux. And, um, and this obviously has tremendous importance also for, for the role of the UN in, in the ongoing reordering. I think it's, it's clear that will, the UN will continue to play a role as, a, as both an actor and a stake in this reordering, but how big a role it will be. Will it be a leading actor? It's, it's maybe not, as it seems right now, but maybe <laughs> it will take a, a, on a more prominent role at some point. And it's definitely not the only stage on which uh, these global governance reordering uh, are being um, ne renegotiated and, uh, and fought over. Um, so I think that is, that is one of the questions that we will discuss in this panel or that we have with us a very qualified uh, set of panelists to discuss on what will be the role of, of the UN in both in the reordering of the world and in the, in the future order that we may be seeing or moving towards. Um, so to help us grasp these, uh, these questions, we have, as I, as I mentioned, a highly qualified panel of experts and they each bring a, a quite different perspective to these, uh, these questions. They will be speaking in the order of the program and I'll introduce them uh, in that order as well. So, so firstly, we will hear from Thomas G. Weiss, who's a presidential professor at the Graduate Institute of the City University of New York. He's, uh, he's basically a, the, a leading expert on everything United Nations, um, <laughs> including especially the norms and the ideas that have underpinned and, and and been shaped and, and the role of the UN in shaping the normative uh, understandings of, of world order. Um, and his latest books ask, would the world be better without the UN? Uh, so we will hear from him this perspective from very much within the UN and a New York perspective. And the New York perspective also means that there will be, I think, uh, a focus on, on the role of the US and what's happening in, in the US these years. And then we have Ellen Margrethe Loy, who uh, I think everybody in this room knows. Uh, so I will, I will spare you the long, uh, uh, the details of her impressive career in both the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the United Nations. But she will, uh, with that background, she will speak to us on, on the role of the United Nations, sort of seen from a practitioner, from a, from a small uh, member state, and uh, as a practitioner in both the Security Council and in the field where she's worked for the UN in South Sudan and Liberia. 
And then last but not least, we have Oliveira, who's a professor of international relations at the Department of Political Science here in Copenhagen. And he has a, a background in peace and conflict studies and um, <coughs> is one of the founding fathers of the Copenhagen School. So one of the, uh, probably the most well-known international scholar, Danish international scholar outside Denmark. Um, and to be fair, I don't know, knowing Ole, I don't know exactly what he will speak about. <laughs> <laughs> but I know uh, for sure it will be interesting. Um, so he will be speaking uh, last. And, and each of the panelists have uh, 12 minutes. And I will try to be sort of strict in, in upholding that. So we have time for questions and answers afterwards. But first, Thomas, the floor is yours. Tom. <coughs> well, thanks for the kind words, Louisa. Um, I can guarantee that my irreverent daughters would emphasize different parts of my past, but <laughs> we'll not dwell on that. Um, I'm actually going to try to build on what Logan has where he started, um, and I am going to ask, would the world be better without the UN? This is not only a cheap gimmick to sell my book, um, <laughs> but it's actually a real question, and I think it's an all too real possibility. I'm not very good at math, but a while back I started calculating that, for me, this is an existential question, because I was conceived while well, the San Francisco conference was uh, uh, in session. And I was actually <laughs> born early in 46 when the first sessions of the General Assembly and the Security Council met in London. So my entire life has been spent, and most of my an analytical career is on the behavior or misbehavior of the UN. I'm gonna add a second question. Would the world be better without Trump as president <laughs> of the US? And the answers to both questions are actually fairly important. Um, Ole, you know we're not paid to predict anything, which is what um, the, the first introductory address tried to say. Uh, and I'm not sure whether 219 is going to be better, worse, or about the same uh, in terms of multilateralism. So my answer to the first question is a considered, measured no. The answer to the second question is an obviously unequivocal yes. And I hope there's some material in the book that permits looking seriously at the fact that there is a visceral aversion in Washington. All of the people who are in this room would not gather in Washington, D.C. this week uh, against anything that involves whether it's international peace and security or economic and social development, anything that involves multilateral collaboration. We postal ways. So answering the question in my book's title would be essential at any time since 45, but it's even more essential in the age of Trump. It's even more essential still with John Bolton uh, as the third national security advisor. Those of you who spent time in New York may recall his almost two years uh, of uh, unconfirmed presence as the perm rep, doing everything he could to um, develop the proposition that partners and allies don't have any role in a kind of zero-sum ideology. Do these Trump and Bolton um, sustain cooperation for mutual benefits uh, are not something they believe in or do ever. So that's the starting point. So whether this year is going to be better, worse, or about the same, I start off with two big considerations. We're talking about the UN, but frankly, it's an entire approach to anti-multilateralism. It's pertinent for security or anything else. So NATO doesn't fare any better uh, than the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the European Union, NAFTA, the World Trade Organization. So these are moving ahead, either with the US in active opposition or attacking them. The way informal groupings do, so the G7 and the G20 have become the G7 minus one and the G20 minus one. The second big fact is that the administration doesn't actually believe in multilateralism. Um, if we had an introductory course in international relations, you'd ask, what's the minimum number required for multilateralism? And that would be three. 
Well, NAFTA turned into two sets of bilateral deals. So, in case you're not going to buy the book, the answer is on page 190, uh, no. Um, now, you might say, well, that's pretty obvious, Thomas, because the late uh, Kofi Annan was kind enough to write it forward. But I ask an honest question, and the answers involved uncomfortable, not alternative, uncomfortable facts for both foes and friends of multilateralism. I try to use two sets of counterfactuals, which some people dismiss as toys of social scientists, but I think they're actually useful in trying to say, what if? Because in fact, the United States, as well as other countries, have benefited from this order. And so Washington needs to look at that reality. So negating that proposition would say, asserting that the world would not be worse off, for example, you can list a whole set of things, getting rid of smallpox in 1977, or trying to do the same thing presently for polio and almost there in Guinea World. Or since 46, trying to make progress on women's rights. Or since 87, to try to look at climate change. Deliver emergency assistance in the Sudan or DRC or Somalia, keeping the peace on the Golan or Kashmir, trying to go after war criminals, and the list goes on. But the second counterfactual is for a different audience. It's not for the Heritage Foundation. Uh, it's actually for UN cheerleaders who blindly wave their blue pom-poms um, because there are substantial debits on the UN's ledger as well. It would help to maintain that we couldn't be in a whole lot better place if the member states and UN civil servants behaved in a more responsible fashion. So we can point to lots of things. Obviously, the, uh, we've mentioned the Security Council, and you don't have to go back to Rwanda, you just have to think about last week in Syria or Myanmar. Or the staff had performed better if they were a little more courageous in attacking governments and monitoring what they're up to. And frankly, if there were a whole lot fewer turf battles in the UN system. In short, the second counterfactual says that we could be in a whole lot better place if states and civil servants were more creative, competent, and courageous. So I, when I wrote this proposal to the Carnegie Corporation, which was very kind in supporting the work, I had to accelerate it <coughs> in light of the elections of 2016. <coughs> and what's important for people here to recognize is that this conversation doesn't occur in the United States. The word multilateralism, the word UN, appeared nowhere in the midterm elections in November. They didn't actually appear in the presidential debate of 2016. So this is a huge, huge blind spot. And if we look at what happened in 2016, just ticking off the uh, stopping of funding to the Population Fund, pulling out of UNESCO officially, Paris Agreement, reneging on the Green, green uh, Climate Fund, uh, getting out of the Compact on Migration, and then at the end of the year, stopping funding for UNRWA. And 218 was just as awful, but by a cesspool, Nikki Haley's words about the Human Rights Council, after having ripped up the P5 plus one Iran deal and stopping UNRWA and UQ. The new US ambassador has absolutely no qualifications. I don't think that it'll remain a cabinet level position, but I could be wrong there. Um, but that will indicate, along with uh, the Secretary of State's remarks in Brussels last, week, uh, last month, um, that even saw the World Bank and the IMF as contributing to the corrosion, his words, of the international system. So, I'm usually an inveterate optimist, <laughs> um, but it seems to me that the shots across the UN and the multilateral bow in general in 2017 and 2018 may become broadsides this year. 
my optimism still remains there slightly. It's important to keep in mind that the predecessor for Trump's efforts, the America First Committee, was the largest and shortest-lived anti-war group ever, founded by proto-fascists, you know, Henry Ford and Charles Coughlin and Charles Lindbergh, to keep the U.S. out of World War II. It lasted exactly 11 months. Trump's version has not as yet collapsed. It will, although I hope without the incentive of a Pearl Harbor. So, Danes are persuaded that at the second decade of the 21st century, the Universal UN is a place, logical place, to hold conversations. I do too, but this realization is not in Washington. Um, so, let me close by wondering, sort of out loud, whether the Secretary General, to use Trolls started out by saying we've been reforming for a long time. Whether the Secretary General could use the um, tightening of financial screws to do what is long been needed, namely emphasizing what the UN can do as comparative advantages and what it can't do, and including centralizing lots of operations and trimming the bureaucracy. I hope he succeeds uh, uh, because I don't see the evidence being all that encouraging. I'm hoping that Sam Dawes and Sebastian Van Ensenov will persuade me this afternoon to have more optimism because if the Secretary General fails, we're going to have a real-time test of my proposition that the world could, in fact, be much worse without the United Nations. And we should not forget, um, and I'd have to say, at least my conversations here suggest that Denmark is also not immune from this new nationalism. Uh, the age of Trump is also Brexit, and Putin and Xi, and Erdogan and Bolsonaro, or Orban and Duterte, and the list goes on. So I think that we should keep in mind two remarks. The first one is the one attributed to Hammarskjöld that, you know, we're not doing this to get, this wasn't designed to get us to heaven, but to keep us from hell. And I would argue in the book that one of the reasons we're not already in the netherworld is the UN. But a world without it, alas, is not impossible to imagine. So, in short, in the old order, and in the current order, and in, if it's new or old, uh, the, what we're going to be dealing with in 219, uh, Warts and all, the UN remains an essential player. Trump closed his remarks in 217 by saying, we are calling for a great reawakening of nations. He overlooked the fact, if he ever knew it, that the United States helped to create this institution to curb the demonstrated horrors of nations and of nationalism run amok. So he's not going to do it, but the rest of us, including the Danes, uh, should be calling for a reawakening of the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for a slight bit of optimism, although tempered. <laughs> and, uh, and now the word is yours, Ellen Magrede. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad Thomas came to the conclusion that, uh, to his question uh, on would the world be better without the UN, that that was a no. Because I very strongly believe when I hear those discussions that if we didn't have the UN, we would have to reinvent it. And to that I would say, given the global order today, it would be pretty difficult to reinvent an organization like the UN today. So we should work with what we have and try and find uh, whatever solutions to challenges that we can clearly see the UN has. But I would also like to see, say that it is so easy, regardless of what you are uh, discussing in relation to the UN that you don't like, to point the finger 
and say, oh, it's those UN bureaucrats, it's that Secretary General. And all too often, member states forget the tremendous responsibility they themselves have. And I can tell you that because I have been serving, as you know, for 10 years in New York as a Danish diplomat and for over six years in the field. And in New York, I mean, what the member states are doing, even to undercut reform proposals, our last ambassador to New York, Ip is here, uh, and when he was trying to work on that, what they are running around doing behind is unbelievable. So I think member states also need to take a, a, a responsibility for what's not functioning. Listen, I would uh, like to focus a bit on how the Security Council is functioning and what is needed to, for them to function better in relation to what I have been dealing with uh, as soon, yeah, the last 10 years, peacekeeping. Uh, and I would like to say that again, uh, you might discuss later in, in the other working group reform of the Security Council. We can all agree that if we created the Security Council today, it would have different membership. It does not represent the order of the world today. It did back when at creation, but not today. We have been discussing that. We had what we call the open-ended working group on Security Council reform for many, many years. Uh, I think it still exists, but nowadays we call it the never-ending work, working group. And, and, and with the politics in certain member states, be it the US, be it European countries and others, I don't think that there will be a breakthrough uh, around the corner. So we'll have to work on the, with the Security Council the way it is uh, composed today and see if we can get them to work better. Uh, and I would like to say that I see two very important challenges in relation to the way the council is dealing with peacekeeping and taking decisions on peacekeeping. And I see today the council being deeply split, primarily due to the disagreement of major players on the Syria conflict and the conflict Krim and Ukraine. The council has been split on such issues previously. Uh, when the invasion of Iraq took place, the council was deeply split, even the European Union on that. But contrary to then, Today, this split and disagreement on issues like Syria and, and Ukraine has actually repercussions for other conflicts on the Security Council agenda. That I did not see at the time of the Iraq crisis. But I see it today, uh, and I saw it uh, uh, very clearly in relation to South Sudan. Uh, for instance, after the unrest we had in South Sudan in the middle of 2016, the council decided, without asking the UN at all whether it was a good idea, that we needed 5,000 more troops. And the penholder got the resolution through in the council, but lo and behold, Four countries abstained, including Russia, including China, etc. That didn't sort of facilitate my work in trying to get the authorities to work with us on this uh, uh, and, and, and the tasking of this force. And there's another example from South Sudan that's been discussed for years and years. Well, uh, at least since the crisis broke out in 2013, that they needed, we needed a weapons embargo. But there was no agreement on a weapons embargo for years because the countries surrounding South Sudan were all eagerly selling and supplying weapons to the, the fighting forces inside. But love and behold, 
you need nine votes to get a, a resolution through the council. In July last year, the United States had managed to get nine votes for a weapons embargo. But if you have nine votes, you have six abstentions. And among them were, of course, China, Russia, and even the neighboring only neighboring country of South Sudan uh, serving on the council, Ethiopia. I'm sorry to say you can do a lot of hula baloo in, 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 uh, about how important and how successful we were with the weapons embargo, but it risks being words on the paper and not actually implementable. So that is a very dangerous turn the council has taken in my view. And my second point about the council and dealing with peacekeeping is that the distance between New York and the field is getting bigger and bigger. Already when I was appointed to go to Liberia in 2008, everybody said to me, oh, it must be a tremendous advantage to have been a representative on the Security Council and now go and be head of a peacekeeping mission. But I can promise you I haven't been on the ground, muddy ground, in Liberia for long before I learned that it would have actually been um, much better if I had done that in the reverse order. It is so much easier to solve the problem in a conflict-ridden country in an air-conditioned meeting room in New York where you are not disturbed by the realities on the ground. And what has that resulted in? It has resulted in mandates approved by the Security Council that are all over. The bigger missions have mandates, often 13, 18 pages, and then you can pick and choose on how much you can implement. Because the member states of the Security Council want to make sure that each and every uh, item is covered and makes no priority. And often they are also adopted without sufficient focus on finding a political solution to what's going on in the country. Again, my example from South Sudan, after the civil war broke out, 1314, 10,000 more troops. That was the answer. Not much focus on how do we get them to talk together and solve it. More troops. We have done something. And again, then in 16, as I said, we had the crisis that broke up again. 5,000 more troops. But I would also say that it's not only the, the permanent members of the Security Council that are acting this way. In fact, I would say that the elected members are contributing even more to this roller coaster. As I jokingly normally say to them, they are using their copy and paste button on their computer over and over again when drafting mandates. That led me, and I shocked them at the time, in 2010, uh, during a debate in the Council on Peacekeeping, I talked about Christmas tree mandates. And uh, I highlighted that the task we were supposed to perform has to be adopted to the challenge and the situation on the ground. Protection of civilians is ultimately what the goal of any peacekeeping mi mi mission is to achieve. But you have to protect civilians in differently in different countries depending on who are threatening civilians. I was sitting in Liberia and should protect civilians, yes, but there the civil, uh, the, uh, those who were threatening civilians were other civilians. As a different way of doing it compared to Darfur or South Sudan, where the threat against civilians are military units or armed groups. And uh, uh, 
those of you who are in uniform will know that. I mean, you don't just start using your heavy equipment shooting down the civilians uh, demonstrating uh, and fighting with other civilians. And then there's the whole question on cross-cutting issues. There's a lot of cross-cutting issues in UN peacekeeping mandates. Some of them, I think, are really, really to the point. I mean, we do ha need to have uh, things in, in, in mandates about uh, women and integration of women and so on, because the ultimate get, get, uh, goal is, is to uh, create a society where everybody can live in peace and security. So there are all these cross-cutting issues, and many of them are very pertinent, but they are growing and growing and growing. And the latest is climate change. And I'm, I'm shaking my head a bit, maybe because I'm getting too old. Because does anybody really believe that solutions to climate change issues in today's political world will be achieved in the Security Council? I doubt it. I think this very important challenge should be dealt with in the bodies of the General Assembly and with the participation of all member states. In the Council, we'll just have a US veto. We will get nowhere. Why waste the time on it? And I agree that missions should take care of the environment and so on, but I don't think a peacekeeping mission will be the one that uh, makes sure that um, the main issues on climate change will be changed and the temperature will not increase drastically. So this is a lot about problems. What solution to these challenges? There, uh, the Secretary General have tried to address it as part of his many reform proposals. In March last year, during a debate in the Security Council, he launched what he called his Action for Peacekeeping. He urged member states to sharpen and streamline mandates and to put an end to mandates that looks like Christmas trees. Christmas is over, as he said. I loved it. He called on member states to push for political solutions and inclusive peace processes. And he said, and I quote, a peacekeeping operation is not an army or a counterterrorism force or a humanitarian agency. It is a tool to create the space for a national own political solution, end of quote. And then he also included uh, a number of issues about improving the performance of the peacekeepers and to improve the safety and security of the peacekeepers. And that was a lot of enthusiasm and all member states were very eagerly discussing his proposals and uh, some words were changed here and there and a declaration of shared commitments on UN peacekeeping operation were developed and 151 of the 193 member states, including all the permanent members of the council, have signed on to that declaration in September. Now we are in January. I'm still waiting to see the result of the commitment to this declaration for instance, in the mandates that the Council have approved since then. I really think that it's a clear point where we need urgent member states action, and I think and I hope those uh, who are uh, dealing with these issues in New York will bring this up when they come to the very difficult discussion later this year about financing of the peacekeeping missions, because here I think there could be leverage in getting them more streamlined. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for pointing out the, the continuities.
and all of these problems are not all <laughs> brand new. Many of them has been with us for a while. Uh, and now, Olaf, I would like to, I'm interested to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever will come. Yes, um, I will try to, to take a bit uh, of the big picture um, and start from looking at, at the, the international system and from there I say something more general about the conditions for the UN's role in peace and security. So in that sense, in some sense, it will be more deductive. Not, I'm not going to observe and give, give insights in what is actually happening in the UN because I know so little about it compared to my co-panelists. So I'll not pretend to uh, know all the details of what is happening day in and day out in the UN. So I'll rather try to say, if we project also a little, little further into the future, how the world is changing, what does that tell us about the possibilities for the UN to play what role? And by the international system here, I do not mean Donald Trump. Uh, I mean some of the slightly bigger trends that might be going on, have been going on for a while and will continue. And that some of these might to some extent be the causes of phenomena like Trump and Brexit and so on. So this is so to say my independent variable, how is the world changing, big picture, and the dependent variable, the effects, is then the UN. What happens to the UN? But then of course you have to ask, what, what is the UN? What do we mean by the US, UN? And there's a tendency that we focus mostly on the Security Council. I get this phone call uh, regularly from journalists especially, who say, doesn't this prove that the UN is just a failure? Now this is no action in Syria, whatever. The UN is just, forget about the UN, right? Uh, and then they really mean the Security Council and nothing else. And of course there are many ways to, to structure this issue, but I'll talk about three different UNs. One being the Security Council, obviously, the second being the General Assembly, and the third being the machinery, the big network of secretariats, missions, agencies, and to some extent the Secretary General himself. And to some, in some cases also linked up to, to the special organization. Uh, so, what are the changes that we see in general? This is not revolutionary stuff, it's not very surprising, but let's just remind us what is happening mm -hmm. to the world in general, been going on for uh, at least uh, a decade, uh, and it will continue. Three changes, the first is the changes in the power distribution in the world, the power structure of the world. We see a general shift from north to south, from west to east. We see a tendency for more powers to matter. Um, we see that no power wants to play the role of superpower, but we see many great powers. So the big, if we talk the language of political science, the polarity, we don't have unipolarity with one superpower. We don't have bipolarity with two superpowers. We don't even have multipolarity with, because that would mean a kind of tight system of rivaling powers that are intensely operating on that scale of which they are placed. What we are seeing is what I would rather call the world after the last superpower. A world where there's no one who positions himself truly at the global level. This also means a system where no one is taking responsibility. And that's why what we mostly see from the, the greater players is not that they do stupid things, but usually that they do less than we want. We have been complaining for so many years about all, the, often complaining especially about the US doing things that they shouldn't have done, and now we mostly complain that they don't do anything, and most of the problems we have in the world are more about too little rather than too much. We see Syria, climate change, trade negotiations, whatever. We just see it's very difficult to mobilize international action. This is, of course, the problematic side. The good side of this world with no superpowers is we also don't have a wo world that is basically run by the rivalry among, as a, a, among powers. They are simply not very globally oriented. They are not very intensely involved. It's a decentralized and disengaged world. So that's the, f and that is, that is not some, that's not Trump. This is something that has been going on, and some of us even predicted it uh, 15 years ago, uh, that this was the trend, so it's not something invented for the day. Um, second trend is the world is becoming post-Western. That we are not, we're no longer in a world where one part of the world has the authority to define what is the truth, what are the standards, what are the rules of the game, uh, the world has become multi-centered also in, its, in terms of meaning and values and, and, and standards. 
it is in that sense becoming more equal, more balanced. Um, and that is of course something that is very difficult to accommodate for the West. And we might argue, and I think it could be argued pretty convincingly, that that is ultimately the reasons for the inner crisis in especially the most Western countries of the West. The reason why countries like the UK and the US uh, have been doing rather weird things recently uh, is because of uh, that kind of crisis of self-understanding in a world that no longer is the world they used to think of themselves in. And the third trend, which I'll say less about today, is that the world is becoming regionalized. It's less global, it's more diverse. What, it, what is happening in one part of the world has less immediate impact on what is happening in another part. Very often we hear observers say that this world is becoming also more chaotic. That is to some extent a misleading picture. It is biased by the fact that we are in the privileged part that used to at least think we were running the world and therefore it felt better as long as we could at least do something. So in, in the previous decades, we at least when there was something bad, we did something, then we made it worse by our actions, but it still felt better. So we could do wars in Iraq or Afghanistan and so on. We didn't feel that we were uh, losing control. Actually, we were because our actions didn't work. Uh, now we've, we sense more immediately uh, the, the lack of control, the lack of possibilities to do something. Therefore, we call this world more chaotic, but probably it really isn't. Okay, with these three changes, what does that mean for the UN's role in international security? Well, the first one is obvious. If you look at the UN Security Council in this world, it looks bad. And there's, this is not going to change after Trump. This is a longer term trend. You could specify it in three elements that all have to do with power. Uh, polarity in the sense of what kind of power structure. Uh, we have what this, this world with no superpowers uh, where everyone tries to do as little as possible. Surely that's bad. We have the relationship among the great powers, that is bad. And then the one that is still number one after all has an anti-UN policy. So in that sense, the UN Security Council is not going to change quickly. The conditions for action there is really bad. Then second, the General Assembly. I think it's time to start taking it more serious in these contexts, exactly because we are in this kind of transition period. We are leaving one order and we are moving towards another one which we really have, haven't figured out yet. We don't know what this new world is about, how it looks, what, 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 how to think of it, what is the organizing principles, as Luisa was saying, we, have, we don't have really conceptions for it yet. So we have to start articulating the principles and the ideas for how to think about this new world. And what, what is the global public arena where we can do that? is not only the General Assembly, but it does have a role to play. So what we have seen in the past as well is that the General Assembly is often the place where issues begin to be voiced. And then 20 years later, we have a convention on something. Uh, but the, where, when we go back, it feels, it feels frustrating, but still, this is, this is another level of international uh, development that ideas about monitoring small arms or biodiversity or whatever, get introduced slowly and gradually and then and no one takes it very serious and 20 years later it suddenly has a certain status. So we have to, I think, take more serious that especially in a period like this, we, we have to start having a global discussion and think about where that is happening. And then thirdly, and that's the most tricky part of this, is that a lot of what we're going to talk about in the rest of the day today is really anchored in none of these two places, but rather in the network of bureaucracies, experts, secretariats, special organizations, and so on. That's where we are having discussions of new ideas about prevention, the role of human rights for security, new concepts of peace building, climate refugees. That is not really because of what the members of the Security Council are saying or because what is happening in the General Assembly. It's because these ideas are evolving constantly in the UN as a broader network and a complex animal in its own right. So the third UN is really where most of the ideas that we're talking about are taking shape. The whole lessons learned and the 
interface with research and so on is happening in this. And actually, I would still claim, this is of course difficult to demonstrate, that there is actually a lot of progress there. That we have actually, in small detail, gotten better at how we handle complicated situations. We both understand situations better, we understand the dynamics and the interactions between different factors better. We have a more and more inclusive approach uh, to all kinds of issues. And there is actually, in that sense, a kind of progress happening in the real existing UN in the larger sense, but ironically, most often when it's insulated from political trends. So to sum up, we're really talking about three different basic forms of politics. So we can I say we have high politics in the classical sense, the great power politics and so on, the little hope in that arena. Secondly, we have the more inclusive, talkative, slow politics which will probably be increasingly important, but also slow. So it's not going to solve anything here now, we just have to re realize we have to invest there as well because we are in a transitionary period. And then the third form of politics is in some sense technocratic. It's removed from the truly political uh, organs. This is not ideal, it's far from ideal, but it seems to be our best hope at the point at the time that might be to some extent a bias coming out of us that most of the people in this room are parts of that network we are in NGOs or in in expertise or in pra practicing uh, in in the various parts of the machinery so maybe it's not so strange that we think that that's where hope lay but we do uh, and I think in that sense to sum up here what I've tried to do is to put this in a perspective of, of the longer trends and also a broader picture of the UN, which really says ultimately the UN will be crucial still in peace and security, but in a very different way. And to sum up then, the Security Council, which we usually put at the center, will be very constrained and will be disappointing and remain so for a long time. The General Assembly will in the longer run be more important because we have to start thinking. And then the machinery has an increasingly independent role. So the good news is that what is actually practiced in the full complex whole of the organization is getting better and better, better at prevention, better at conflict management, better at conflict transformations and so on. The bad news is this is happening despite and not because of state policies and often hampered in all kinds of ways by state policies. This tension will only get stronger and it's tragic especially for someone like me who likes politics, to say the best hope is in such a technocratic vision. And it's also tragic to say that most likely this is actually unsustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ole. Um, I think we, we have now uh, almost half an hour, 25 minutes or so. Um, for question and answers, and there will be microphones in, uh, in, on the floor, and I would like you to, uh, to, to be short and precise, not to sort of give a long statement or, uh, or a long comment, but just stick to a clear answer or, or a clear question, which the panelists can then answer. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, please also state your name and your institutional affiliation if you have that. So if I can see now a show of hands, that would be lovely, yes. We have this, uh, this one here, um, there, and then another one over here. We'll take three first, and then uh, I'll ask the panel to, to respond. Thank you. Hi, um, is that working?
very much for, for the three great presentations. My name is uh, Christian Tuber Christian. I'm from the Center for Research Studies. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with one, and it, it goes uh, primarily to Ole. Um, I think your, your characterization of, of the UN as, as a, as a three-headed animal or, or a three component parts with, with, uh, with the Security Council, General Assembly, and the sort of the broader bureaucratic expertise network is, is, is spot on. My question is, as, as you see the, the, the sort of the potential for, 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 for beneficial stuff happening, almost exclusively uh, at the later two, latter two, and especially the, 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 the bureaucratic expertise network, but isn't, but my, my question is, how much independent agency is actually present there? How much can it sort of, on one side, run, run its own show, uh, and on the other hand, will it not be uh, constrained, boxed in, undermined uh, by the two other, if not both, then at least one of the other power centers uh, that you talk about? Thank you. Thank you, and then we have a question up front here. Thanks very much, uh, Emily Cadden Rose. Um, thanks to all the panelists for their remarks. My question is for um, is for Ole Weaver, and it builds on the question that was just asked. I wonder. I, I think your characterization, breaking it down into th the three uh, dimensions, is really fascinating. I'm wondering, though, what that looks like if we take the UN and we put the UN into a broader landscape of international institutions. Um, and if we talk about defection from the UN and the creation of alternative mechanisms, not just for addressing issues of peace and security, but issues of global governance more broadly, and particularly alternative technocratic forums that address the non-Western shift in global politics that you speak of. Um, so to summarize, sort of what does, what does the relevance of the UN look like going forward if we see it in this broader <coughs> network of institutions and actors that are also shifting. Thank you very much. I think we have three excellent questions here. I'll use the chair's privilege and throw in a question of my own, um, and I'll direct it to you, Thomas. Because you spoke a lot of, on, on Trump and the danger that Trump poses to the, to the current world order. But I think we will, it will also be interesting to hear your perspectives on the, the rise of China and what China means also to the normative work of, of the UN and the normative identity of UN's um, position in, uh, in global governance. Thank you. So, and if, uh, if uh, Ellen McGrady, you start, and then uh, uh, Ole, and then Thomas last. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on the widening gap between New York and the field, let me make two points. Uh, which I tried to uh, a little politely to say, that it's especially to the elected members of the Security Council. They have to remember, they're all eager to serve on the council, but they have to remember they're there to be able to discuss the various crises on the council agenda and not just copy and paste on cross-cutting issues. I will not say what country it was, but some years ago I was asked to come to their capital and to tell them about how we, Denmark, had planned for our membership in four and five, and I told them five and six. And then somebody said, oh, we don't know anything about the conflicts on the agenda of the council, so we will focus on cross-cutting issues. And my answer was very firm, then you don't belong in the council. And it's the same message I'm giving to the Foreign Office here in Copenhagen, who are sort of s beginning slowly to think about their candidate uh, for the council. You have to be able to bring something to the table for the solution of those conflicts. The second thing is, in the m I find, in the method of work of the council, uh, you know, they have open debates and then they have consultations behind closed doors where the deals are being made and so on and so forth. And, you know, the Secretary General may make regular reports. And sometimes they ask us to come from the field to present it. Now I find that they are spending all their time on getting briefings. Even though it's a report from the Secretary General, he can in, they can invite three or four 
entities from the UN Secretariat to make a briefing on the same report, but it was coordinated before he approved it. So why do we have to have the SRSG from the field? Why do we have to have the human rights representative or the OCHA representative? It becomes a talk shop and there will be less, less opportunity to try and discuss and see how we move forward. And my last meeting in the council in November uh, 2016, after they had given all their statements in the council, we went into close uh, consultations where they were suppo uh, supposed to ask sort of more detailed questions and the clock had been running and there was no time. That, those two things really we have to work on. Thanks a lot for two really good questions. Um, Christian, um, you, you, I mean, as always, it wasn't really a question, it was an argument, but uh, um, you, you suggest that probably I overestimate the ability of, of these agencies to, to run the show themselves, aren't they boxed in by the political level and so on? I totally agree, uh, and that's the reason for my kind of final line of saying that ultimately this is probably unsustainable, or at least we see, of course, constantly that efforts are kicked three steps back, three steps back again, three steps back, by all kind of political, a lot of what Elmeret is talking about as well. So of course it is difficult in practice, and it might also in the long run become increasingly problematic to have this split. Uh, I mean, we, we're likely to enter a vicious circle also with populism. I mean, what is it that the populists are reacting against? It is to some extent exactly this vision of an international bureaucracy of, of world government run by bureaucrats and so on. So there, we can easily get a vicious circle by the fact that we get the political level destroyed by this populism means we shift even more attention over to the technocratical, which is exactly what they react to. And so so I, I don't see a happy scenario there. It's just the best that I can come up with. Um, and, to, and to your question, I think that's, that's fascinating to think a, a bit further about this in, in relation to global governance and so on. I think a lot of the other institutions have less independent momentum so it's, it has less volume and therefore, I mean, there's some that have, but lots of them don't to the same extent have the ability to just continue uh, without the head uh, as, as the UN is able to. Um, and then I think also you hint at, at the kind of new forms that pop, pop up, come, pop up in, the, in the post Western situation. And that is really fascinating. I see, I think we're beginning to see new forms of international cooperation, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or China's Belt and Road Initiative, which we don't take serious because it doesn't look like our former Western multilateral institutionalism and so on. And also it, it is in many ways not as good, but this is what we're getting. Uh, and in that sense, uh, what I've been trying to preach a bit in, in relation to Danish foreign policy and so on, we can't only lament the tragedy that Western uh, uh, multilateral uh, institutionalism is declining. We also have to take serious in the world where power is spreading, there will be new forms of institutionalization happening Chinese style, which is very diff different. That is not something where the agencies run things themselves. This is very politicized. You see them as very Chinese when they are Chinese, et cetera. So we also see a parallel phenomenon to what I'm talking about, about completely new forms of institutionalization that are hyper-politicized by the kind, I mean, the whole idea of how you create organization doesn't have the, I mean, the whole idea of multilateralism, classical style, is that it has, in a sense, universal rules. The same rules apply to everyone and so on. But the new forms of institutionalization coming out of these powers certainly are not about everyone following the same rules. They have the clear mark of who made them for what purpose. So that's a parallel development that is exact opposite of, of what I talked about so far. Uh, thanks, Louise. I'm sorry, I'm not... Usually I'm not so obsessed with Trump, but um, that's what I was asked to do. Uh, however, it seems to me your question about uh, China is also a question about Russia. And their foreign policy traditionally have been to basically keep the West off balance, if not to drive wedges in Western politics. And therefore, uh, Trump's noises about NATO for this conference, obviously, uh, Putin doesn't have to do anything. He just lets Trump do his work for him. And it seems to me that China has also been presented uh, a uh, leadership um, role here on a silver platter by uh, Trump. And I'll be, I mean, as it's become the largest producer of greenhouse gases, becomes a spokesman for um, climate <laughs> measures or 
uh, a voice for stability and tr free trade. I mean, this is not a role that it's been used to playing. Uh, it will be playing that in, in the future, and I think that's the most likely uh, outcome of uh, Trump's shenanigans. Thank you, and we have now, I already have four people up here that I'll take uh, first, and then I'll try to, it's uh, uh, here with the gray sweater behind you. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, <coughs> Jan Boy Nielsen, uh, the think tank, uh, RICO. Um, I agree very much that we are into a new order, and uh, I think also we have to be uh, focused on looking at conflict, maybe in a new way. I think the normal way in this country is to, to, to look at a conflict, see who is the good part, and uh, then the other part is not the good part. And then you focus very much on, on the good part and line up behind that. I think in conflicts, uh, it, it's necessary to state that there are more, uh, what I say, truths that, uh, so, so my question is, uh, shouldn't we, uh, focus much more on, 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 on a period with dialogue where we try to, 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 to understand the other parts, China, Russia, or, or, or who, who, who it is. So conflict resolution as, as it is, and, and not just go to, 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 to negotiations uh, where we just repeat the same. Thank you, and then there's a question here in, in the back, yes? Um, there. And then you, sir. Thank you, Sebastian Einsiedel from UN University. Thanks to our panelists for, for terrific presentations. I have a question specifically to Ambassador Lloyd. Um, Ellen, you, you rightly highlighted the problem of peacekeeping mandates turning into Christmas trees. And you also suggested there is actually here some potential to change the practice against the background of the action for peacekeeping uh, process. Now, if, let's say, the German ambassador who just joined the council as a non-permanent member um, called you and asked you, what are some concrete proposals how we as Germany can change the practice here, also in light of, of our limited ability to influence the process with pen holdership, et cetera, what would you suggest? And specifically, do you think the strategic reviews um, of which you just led one in the context of Mali is a tool to achieve improvement here. Thank you. Thank you, and then we have two, I'll take two questions up here from this row. So first, uh, yeah, the, and then afterwards you in the green, thank you. Uh, thank you, my name is Augusto Lopez Claus. I'm currently on sabbatical at Georgetown University. I work at the World Bank. Uh, just two very brief questions. One, uh, can the General Assembly be taken more seriously and become more effective in dealing with problems such as climate change and other things, um, as long as we have the one country, one vote principle? Or is there a scope perhaps to rethink that uh, arrangement and move to a system of weighted, weighted voting to empower the General Assembly to be taken more seriously? That, that's one question. The other one is, could the creation of a World Parliamentary Assembly, you know, a second chamber advisory powers you know, be perhaps a catalyst for precipitating change and ownership on the part of the members uh, within, within the United Nations. I think one of the problems with the United Nations is it doesn't have a lot of le democratic legitimacy. The people who serve on the, on the General Assembly are diplomats. They are politicians. They are members of whoever happens to be in power. And in the case of countries that are not democratic, they have no connection whatever with the people. The UN Charter says, we the people. Can I speak to Hilda Seniors? We know from the Hilda Charter that member states confer the primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and order through the Security Council to act on their behalf. But it's the primary responsibility There is the secondary responsibility which remains to the General Assembly as ruled by the International Court of Justice. Now, in what ways do you see the General Assembly in concrete ways, Mr. Schumann, 
we see the appearance in as shown it's a second layer of responsibility in all the systems of the world thank you Thank you very much. I think we have interesting questions on the role of the General Assembly and on conflict resolutions and, and specifically trying to move into how, how do we actually move forward? What kind of tools are, are relevant or how could things be improved? And I think if we'll uh, maybe El Magrede, if you start and then uh, uh, Thomas and then uh, Ole can conclude. Thank you. When I talked about action for peacekeeping and the declaration and the commitments undertaken by member states, I think I finished by saying I hope that when we come to the budget negotiations, we would have greater hope of having these commitments implemented. Because there's a high pressure, including from the United States, but also from others, to reduce the over $1 billion peacekeeping budgets. And one way of doing that is actually to prioritize the mandates and not put everything that needs to be done in a fragile country or a country in conflict or just coming out of conflict into the mandate of the Security Council. We have a tendency, the UN has a tendency and the Security Council is in, in saying everything has to be done at the same time, which it of course cannot be in practice, but it costs money to have all these units in the mission doing rule of law and doing uh, capacity building for this, that, and the other, although it will take a year or two before we get down the line. So we don't have, I mean, I would love to have mandates that focus what is needed within the next six months to 12 months. And then those mandates, instead of just being copied and renewed and renewed for 10 years, could evolve as the situation on the ground uh, uh, develops. Things could go out, that has been done, now we can move on this and that. But instead, you know, you start with a full 18 pages on everything that has to happen and you get units in the mission that cost money and you know some of it, You, if you are lucky, you cannot start on for five years or so. <laughs> so that kind of more practical thing I would really like. Uh, and I would like, uh, somebody said also uh, about, uh, you're talking about diplomat, but I would really like that council members had more, or at least some of their staff, uh, hands-on feel, uh, knowledge of what's going on in, 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 I mean, I can tell you after the conflict in South Sudan, and I don't want to tell you who it was, we had a security council yeah. visit, to South Sudan and they were talking with some of the IDPs in the camp and I was accompanying them and I was totally shocked because the IDPs were telling them very loudly, we want Vice President Mashar back, we don't care about the other, uh, the other one. And then the Security Council members were meeting the press and they asked questions about uh, what they have been told and then they said, oh, it was all this that women couldn't pass safe, safely on, uh, on the streets to go and pick up their firewood and so on. They hadn't picked up that the group we were dealing with were highly, highly political and not, not uh, humanitarian suffering. So, so you know, more rea reality into it is, is to me crucial. I will not, I'll leave the rest to you two. I, I've now become the rest after the West. Yeah, no, okay. the <laughs> so, um, I, just, just a word on, on savings for peacekeeping um, and the U.S. pushing. Uh, and this, I think, provides a bit of a mandate for the next panel on human rights. Uh, you know, the, the savings amounted to the U.S. budget of a rounding error. I mean, the U.S. saved after all is said and done about seventy million dollars. I mean, this is this is trivial, but. The proposals that came out to help save money also came from Russia and China, that the best thing to keep out of peacekeeping operations are these pesky human rights monitors because uh, they get in the way of, of lots of things. So that's, that's the kind of savings that uh, perhaps we hadn't anticipated. Um, Ola used the term earlier, uh, 
the UN is a dependent variable. Um, you know, that politics influences the UN, the UN doesn't influence politics, more or less. Um, I, I think that's true, but it's, there's more agency uh, possible. Uh, obviously, the, the Security Council is the big act in town, but there's lots more agency than people commonly think. I'm not really, I have no idea how to make the, the General Assembly more representative people, but the third UN, which is something I've done some work on, and Ole mentioned that, and this is a professional malady because I'm obviously part of it, um, and so maybe we should discount it, but uh, in lots of the work I've done uh, related to ideas, norms, and principles, it's really this other UN that has been responsible for change, whether that's NGOs as advocates, whether it's transnational corporations participating, particularly now in a new technological era, whether it's experts, international commissions, think tanks. Um, this, it seems to me, is the way to get in additional voices in a sort of scattered way, perhaps, and not as neat as a world parliamentary assembly. But I see this happening much more easily and much more frequently. And as the second UN uh, diminishes, um, is, sh is shrinking of, of uh, officials, uh, it seems to me that this third UN has a huge role to play and will be playing in this new order a much more important role. Um, I, I, I think I'll just make a few comments on especially the questions on, on the General Assembly. Um, um, I mean, you asked about whether, I, I, I didn't get if you had a kind of critical tone of saying that, well, the General <laughs> Assembly is not really in a good position to deal with things like climate change, given that everyone has to agree and so on. Uh, and I think it, it's a very important question because in some sense you might say that our main institutions for dealing with climate change, UNFCCC, actually is structured like this General Assembly. It's also a place where every country has, has to, in a sense, to be brought about, around. So in some sense, it is the General Assembly just under another name that deals with climate change already. Uh, and that shows us also the problem, uh, because what we have now is that they're, they're doing as much as it's possible to do in that form. And I think, I mean, I've tried to, to an analyze the international institutional architecture around climate change, and as, as I see it, it's really the other half that is missing. There we need the kind of small organ of the main access to complement that structure where everyone is represented. So this is actually an illustration of already something that is like the General Assembly playing the role it can, and what we need is the other half. Uh, so that is a reminder to of, of, of how that kind of synergy between these two kinds of organizations actually have to work in other areas as well, which is also then my answer to your question over here, that, that uh, could we imagine that the General Assembly also takes on a more practical role, not only the ideas role that I pointed to, I mainly pointed to the role of being the place where we start to articulate ideas. And I think it's a good point. We are probably going to see a little more of that by default, in the, in the, by the fact that the less the Security Council does, the more we will see that some of these discussions have to move there and we, of course, they can always be easily shut down and they might not become very concrete action, but it, we will see a slight shift in that direction simply by default. I just want to uh, uh, say that we have Mons Lugetov sitting here in the room and he was president of the General Assembly <laughs> when the selection of the new Secretary General took place. And I served on the council when Ban Ki-moon was elected 10 years before. And I can just tell you that the involvement from the General Assembly side, thanks to Mons, was, you know, like day and night compared to how it had taken place 10 years ago. And the whole, uh, you know, public uh, appearance in the General Assembly for all the candidates to present themselves and so on, uh, shifted, I mean, formally the council ended up by, by, by voting on who became secret, uh, uh, secretary general. But I think if, if those efforts of the general assembly had not taken place, we could have been sitting with a totally different secretary general and it, there became much more ownership to it. So things are happening, but you have to push it. 
thank you very much. And we have a lot of uh, questions in the audience still, but we're unfortunately running out of time. So I'll just try briefly to, to sum up sort of two main uh, takeaways I, I draw from this conclusion or this discussion. One is that the structures of the UN are basically not suited for the world we have but the world is not moving anywhere towards sort of a new constitutional moment or a San Francisco conference, anything akin to that. So we have no choice but to work with what we have, as El Magreda also said. So that's one point. And the other point is that in that working with what we have, maybe the General Assembly is, is a growing uh, arena of, of more interest and, and uh, an agency, um, even as it, as it has its own flaws, but, but there might be a lot more going for the UN if we stop obsessing about the Security Council and focus on, on some of the other uh, parts of the, uh, of the UN. And I think with those words, I'll, uh, I'll conclude now. We have uh, coffee waiting for us outside for a 20 minutes coffee break, and then we'll readjourn here for the next panel. So thank you very much to the panelists. <laughs>